and first time here in this church. We attended the, uh, what was that, 9.30 service uh, uh, there in the sanctuary, and now we're here, and uh, it's just a joy for me to not only visit places, not only to see the vast land of uh, agricultural produce and the oil rigs, most especially what makes the travel meaningful is to meet friends and new friends. And uh, just, you know, I'm awed at how God, uh, quote unquote, orchestrated my coming to you this morning. When I left the Philippines and even before planning, uh, before coming here, I did not plan to inform anybody because I was not sure whether or not I will be given an entry. As you know, uh, Los Angeles Airport and San Francisco are among the strictest airports now in the United States. And in fact, I was held in, by the immigration uh, officer for about two hours for a uh, more interview. But so I thank the Lord that uh, I believe the guy, the second uh, secondary level, uh, was touched by the Lord. I was telling the truth. And so he was gracious to give me six months. Now my problem is whether or not to fly out on the ticket that I have booked going back to the Philippines or extend my stay. But that's a good problem. Amen. And uh, I'm so glad to uh, meet Pastor Dennis. And I forgot a lot of those things which uh, they had mentioned, Rose earlier mentioned, that I was the one who put the hood when they were uh, graduating or during their graduation. In our seminary, the tradition is, you know, you can have one faculty and one family or your loved one who would join on the stage to put the hood, you know. And so uh, I forgot that moment and sorry, not because I am very, very old, but because there were many other students <laughs> who did that. Well, I retired, not because of my age, I'm just 53 years old, and I don't mind mentioning that. Because I noticed that when I look at my coat and coat, my photo before, I felt I was getting younger. You know, when I saw the baby picture, uh, you can tell what was that picture all about. I retired because we had a program in the school that if you've been teaching for 10 years, you can apply for retirement. And so after teaching for 11 years, I decided to retire and see what the Lord has for me. It's not only retiring, as we say, change tire, retire, but it's also re-road, you know, change road. So I don't know where that road may be, but uh, leave that out to the Lord. When Pastor Dennis asked me to come and share God's word to you, I'm very excited. But then I asked him, what's the focus or is there any series that I would like to, that I can fill in? And then he gave me a very, very difficult topic, and uh, I said, would you please give me a few hours to decide whether or not I'm going to speak on that topic? Because he said he's having a series in the book of Genesis. He just finished, I think, Genesis chapter 3, something like that. But anyway, this topic is very difficult because for a number of reasons, and I'd like to make mention one. The problem of evil and suffering is actually one of the most serious barricades to authentic Christian faith. If not the barricade, a stumbling block to many. There are those who have become believers in Jesus Christ, but somehow some tragedies came to their families, to their loved ones. And because of that, they would raise the question, God, why did you allow that to happen? Life is unfair. I thought God is good all the time. But with this, how can I say God is good? I flew in March 1st. And the week before that, I flew to another island in the Philippines. Five hours by bus, two hours by plane, two hours, three hours, another bus. And the purpose of that trip was to give 
the funeral message to someone very close to us. Well, this family, a pastor, his, his wife, and the only daughter, somehow there was a tragedy unexpected. Three years ago, the husband, the pastor of the church, died. He had been suffering for a number of years, but finally he died. So who remains? The wife and the daughter. The wife became the pastor of that church. And we thought that she would go ahead because she had physical problems. One day, only to notice that her daughter, <coughs> their only daughter, had this hemorrhagic stroke. Admitted in Iloilo Doctor's Hospital for a number of days. Never recovered. Died. But the sad part was this. February 23rd, the day that she was buried, was also her birthday. And I was asked to speak, to deliver that message. I knew the family long time ago, 1970s. We received that baby. We welcomed that baby along with a couple. And I knew that girl growing up. I did not expect that I was asked. I said, I'm flying to the US and normally when you fly international, you somehow limit your travels, right? At least that's for me. But with that, with that one, I could not refuse. I struggled. I met the mother, hugged together, and she said to me, Bert, I have so many questions. And I cannot answer any of those questions. I am tired. I don't know what's next. And you know what? She is a faithful preacher of God's word. Never in her life would she take other responsibilities that will grab her time, grab her time away from preparing God's message. We knew her since then. Choir, we should be on time. It doesn't matter whoever was late, we would start. She taught us punctuality. She taught us seriousness in doing ministry and serving the Lord. While there's joy in serving the Lord, He always challenges us to be serious with the work of the Lord. That's who she is. In fact, I read a post of her sister. Sad. As if to say, she is saying, Lord, take me home. You know, when answers are not enough, you may sing the song, Jesus is the answer. He is there. But even until this time, she could not feel that God is with her. Question is, what's the meaning and purpose of my life? to tell you I don't have the answer yet. And that's why the subject is so sensitive in many, many ways because unless we deal with these issues, perhaps many of us, if not all, may be shipwrecked with our faith. When trials and problems and persecutions come, 50 people already confirmed death in Christchurch, New Zealand. I heard the news this morning, 50. Where is God? Where is God? The title of this message is The Christian Affirmation. The Christian Affirmation in the Problem of Theodicy. This word theodicy may be new to you, but Theodicy is an attempt, it comes from a Greek word actually, compound word, 
but it is an attempt to speak of the goodness and the fairness of God while at the same time talking about the full account of evil and suffering. One side you have the goodness of God, but on the other hand, you have this problem of evil. You see, there are three sides to the problem of evil. As a result of sin, first side is that God is unsurpassably good. That's one side. God is good, unsurpassably good. On the other side, we have God is incomparably powerful. No one else is more powerful than God. But on the other side, suffering and evil exist. And we ask the question, why? We ask the question, why? There are three attempts to these problems. Three tempting solutions. S solutions that are proposed but they could not answer the real human question of why suffering and evil exist. These solutions are not answers per se, but this is these are some of what people would say about answering this problem of the goodness of God and the problem of evil on one hand. The first tempting solution is to say that evil is not really evil. There are some people who would say that evil is relative. I wonder if some people would hold on to that with their convictions, but there are people who have lessened evil to what it really is. Yet when we say that evil is not really evil at all, how can we ignore it in our lives? In our own experiences, in the lives of so many other people, and the persistence of evil, we cannot deny that evil exists. Another tempting solution is to deny the absolute goodness of God. Because of this, we say God is not really good. This song, God is good all the time, is not really true. That's a tempting solution. If that is true, then God is no longer the God of the Bible. The God of the Bible is one who is brimming with unceasing care, unceasing love, and dying mercy. That's not just the answer. Another answer is to claim that this continual continuation and continuance of evil must indicate some limitations of God's power. Because there is evil, therefore God is limited because He cannot stop evil. There is a problem then with His power. But if that is true, if God is limited in power, then evil must be more powerful than God. But that's not true. That's not right. I share this with you because this is the struggle that we find. You see, in Genesis, in the series of Genesis chapter 1 and chapter 2, we had this creation narrative. And everything God said was good. It was not only good because of its aesthetic beauty, but it was good in its quality. It was good in the sense that it serves its ultimate purpose. And that creation of the world included the creation of human beings. 
And then he said, it is not good for man to be alone. In other words, it is good for the man to have his spouse. But after that, there is not only the creation, there was communion. And the communion was between God and the human beings. He created Adam and Eve. Beautiful communion. Communion that wasn't broken in the sense there was no sin. And included in that communion was the commission when God said to Adam and Eve, Go ye and multiply. <clears throat> yes. There was indeed what we call responsible multiplication. But after that, what happened? There was this condescension. Serpent appeared. And the greatest question that will destroy humankind ever since the time and to this day is the question, did God really say? Did God really say? Well, what happened? I call it condescension just to be consistent with letter C, but that was sin. And what we read here earlier in Genesis chapter 3, God said, wow, they have already become like one of us. And that's interesting. The question, did Adam and Eve become like God when they disobeyed Him? Well, only God could have known good and evil. But knowing evil is not part of God's design for Adam and Eve. In fact, when God created them, He said, you know, this beautiful, and I give you all of these things. I have prepared the field for you. And I invite you to till the ground, to be stewards of all of my creation. They will be under you. They will be under your command, one way or the other. Rule over them. That was enough. You know, God shared his ownership to humankind. But not the knowledge of evil and sin. Not only there was this condescension, confusion came in. The problem of confusion. Now we find that in the scripture, of course, and so we are now somehow hooked in this area of confusion. We don't know good and evil in its totality. They didn't know the extent of their disobedience. They didn't know that their disobedience to God would affect their relationship as Adam and Eve. There was this individual, personal consequences of sin. There was also the social consequences of sin, which you later on will find unfolding in the book of Genesis. There was also this material effect of sin, that sin affected the environment and everything. And we find sin becoming universal. You know, we cannot just stand here and say, Adam, you're to be blamed. Because when we look at our lives, we know that we have been like them. And only because we are born human, because we decided to rebel against God. But thank the Lord. Thank the Lord for His great plan to recreate us again. Amen. In the likeness of Christ through the death of Jesus Christ on the cross. And His resurrection from the grave. Now we get into a new creation. We are brought into a new communion with God again. And hope. We learn the lesson. Sin does not make us like God. Sin even made us less human than God intended us to be. And because many people have not realized it, 
the existence of evil continues. The sin would have its consequence. And God said it. And we should not doubt it. Never entertain and carry on and echo the word of the serpent. Did God really say it? Because he said it. Now, the question is, how are we going to uh, answer this question of the problem of the goodness of God and evil on the other hand? I remember the story of Job. Job asked the questions in the early chapters, why, 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 why? And we realized that the most difficult questions ever asked, even starting as we were still small, is why? We don't know the full answer. And God did not answer Job when he continued to raise the question, why? But God answered him with the question, Job, who? Who is this who created? Who is this God? And God displayed who he was. And Job said, wow, I did not understand what I was asking because we asked the wrong question. But even if we ask the question, I would like to, for us to look at seven affirmations this morning. Seven affirmations that when we are faced with this dualistic concept of the goodness of God and the evil of man, I hope that we can stand in the middle, in the light of the cross, in the light of what Jesus did, for himself, for the world, what did he do for himself? He gave himself for us so that we might be redeemed. So that we might be recreated into the newness of life. We stand in the middle and so therefore it's not a question of why. But I would like for us to hold on to seven affirmations this morning. First affirmation. Let us remind ourselves that God does not directly will suffering. Yes, God does not wish any ill to any of His creation, including us. The created order is good because it reflects the goodness of God. Yet, because of sin and finitude, suffering and evil, are very much part of our everyday fabric or everyday fabric of our lives. Suffering may be permitted by God and allowed by God. Why? You ask the question. I don't have the answer. Look at Jesus Christ. A few weeks from now, we will celebrate what we call the Holy Week. I remember that old Negro spiritual song. He could have called 10,000 angels to destroy the world and set him free from the cross. He could have called 10,000 angels, but he died alone for you and me. You see, suffering may be permitted and allowed by God, and even as in the case of Job. In the case of Jesus Christ, that was his plan. That Jesus had to suffer for us. But in the case of Job, God did not directly will his suffering. That's the first affirmation. Second affirmation, the abuse of free will will result in evil. And that takes personal responsibility. The abuse of free will will result in evil. And perhaps this is the most common and accepted approach to formulating any understanding of theodicy of why God is good here on one side and the other side is evil. Why is that? Obviously because of the free will being misused and abused. What if God has not given us free will? Probably we ask of that, but human beings would not be human beings 
without the freedom to choose. Do we know that? We understand that. Well, a third century church father, he was considered one of the great theologians in the late second century and third century. He believed that God knew that humans would abuse the freedom he gave. But he could have prevented only by taking away humankind those attributes. He has given humankind intelligence, accountability, responsibility, but without freedom. They, human beings, would not remain human beings. But the point of the matter is this. The free will sometimes sadly admits that there is too much freedom that God has given to human beings and that's why there is too much evil. How we wish God would restrain our freedom. But let me tell you this. There is no greater joy. There is no greater fulfillment in loving and serving God if there is no full freedom given to us. Our wills were enslaved by sin. But on the other hand, with the new creation that Christ has worked in us, in all the fullness, along with our feeling, will, and intelligence, we are free to love God and serve God fully. Freedom is not a limitation. Freedom, as intended by God, is given for the fullness of our joy in loving others as well. Third, affirmation. And this is very true. God's power can draw good out of evil. You see, from the history that we find from the fall, you know, Adam fell and somehow did not really had a good inheritance given to us. God could have stopped him from falling. If I have to ask the question, God, where were you when the serpent was speaking to Adam? I thought you were around. And even as, as I raise the question, I do not have the answer. What's good out of that disobedience and the consequences of the sin of Adam and Eve? What good when God has closed the garden with a flaming sword so that both of them could not go back and partake of the tree of life, good and evil? I don't have the full answer, but I can suggest something. Because the tree of life is now found and the tree on the cross. <coughs> yes, it was bad then. It was good now. God was able to transform that moment into something great for us. God could have stopped them, but God did not stop them from committing evil. But God continued his plan of redeeming humankind, of recreating a new relationship, of having this wonderful communion with him. And all of those privileges we find in Christ Jesus. Amen. I like 1 Corinthians chapter 15 in many ways. Why is that? Paul was saying, oh, the death word is thy sting. You know? I like that. Because we look forward that the death that the enemy has given to humankind, and that included our Savior, was the last thing that he had with God 
was able to conquer that. And Paul said, he is the first fruit. And time will come that we will be resurrected again. Amen. Yes, God was able to draw good out of evil. But let me have a warning. Let us not be too foolish to choose evil for the sake of God bringing out good out of it. No, because the book of Galatians tells us, whatever a man sows, he shall reap, for God cannot be mocked. Amen. Never abuse. Yes, sin abounds, but grace abounds more. Affirmation four, evil does not limit God's power. Yes, God is infinitely free, but this freedom of God is not threatened by the gift that He has given to humankind. Yes, even with the evil around us, it doesn't mean that God's power is not at work. Going back to the principle or affirmation three, what had happened in Christ Church in New Zealand, cannot be undone but God can recreate something you know what is that people now value their relationships I remember years back that I bought a ship sank in South Korea and many of the missionaries and their children were in the Philippines the boat sank hundreds of them died and they mourned because of the loss, the tragic accident. And you know what happened? A lot of Koreans, there was like an exodus of Koreans going back to South Korea. Why? They now realize the value of relationships in the family. You see, God is not limited because there is evil. But I can say this to the face of the evil. Wait until your end will come. Amen. God will prove once again that he is powerful beyond compare. Only God is insurpassably powerful that he was willing to take the risk. I remember a statement of a great leader, Filipino leader, he said, the unused power is actually the power given. You know, God is not intimidated by what's going on in the world. We know that a lot of bad things will happen and we look forward to that when Jesus Christ will come again and ultimately conquer not just death, but evil. Amen. Amen. And heaven becomes a wonderful place. Affirmation 5. <coughs> Suffering may teach us many valuable lessons. I learned. You learned. All of us learn. On those moments that God has taught us. You know what? There are many things that sufferings can teach us compared to those times that we are in good times. Amen. Yes. Maybe that's the reason why God wants us to have more suffering. I'm just saying that. That you don't learn. Remember God's people. God said, follow me, we'll go to the promised land this way. It could have been just short, more than just one week. Probably about 11 days estimated by foot. You know what happened? It took them 40 years. I like the song, you mentioned that. And because they failed, take another look around my Mount Sinai till you learn your lesson. Till you stop your whining and quit your rebellion. Till you learn to stand in the day of testing by trusting and obeying the Lord. Amen. We would never really trust the Lord in good times. I know we do. 
But it's on those difficult times that we trust the Lord. What do we learn? Simple. Trusting. Trusting. Yes, A wonderful song says, it's easy to have faith when things are doing well. To trust in God when life is not so hard. But when the problems come and the answers not in sight, God wants us to believe that He can make things right. Suffering indeed teaches many lessons to depend and to trust in God. Affirmation six Suffering may highlight the reality of goodness. Suffering may highlight, may highlight the reality of goodness. Yes. There are valleys and shadows of life, but they will help us appreciate even more clearly the brilliance and the promises that God has given us in Jesus Christ. Amen. When there are suffering, we hold on to the promise of God. And the reason why we say God is good all the time is because we have his promises. It is so sweet to trust in Jesus. Just to take Him at His word. Just to rest upon His promise. Just to know the saith the Lord. Jesus, Jesus, how I trust Him. How I have proven Him more and more. Jesus, Jesus, precious Jesus. Oh, <laughs> we need grace to trust him more because it's only at times at times it is only through suffering that the goodness and the reality of God comes out Amen. we will never know the mountain tops without first knowing the valleys and be able to climb to the summit finally Affirmation 7. And that gets into our text. Is this. Nothing can separate us from God's love. Affirm that to yourself. And this text now is very, very important. Nothing can separate us from the love of God. The text that we have read in Romans chapter 8 tells us that the whole creation groans and the whole creation suffers. It's not just about us human beings. Of course, we don't know what the plant felt when the bomb fell on them. We might hear the bleaking sounds of the cow and the animals on the field when something hit them that they're not a part of. But Paul said the whole creation groans. Until the time when all God's people will be revealed. Why? Because it's going to be a revelation not only of God's people, but it's also the revelation of Christ himself coming to us. But meanwhile, we groan because we don't understand when we struggle with our pain of all of these things, the goodness of God and then the evil and the problem of suffering, we cry out to the Lord, Lord, I even don't know what to pray for. You come to the point of your own problems in life and you don't have any words to say except no, no words, Lord. I have experienced it myself. Prayed with no words coming out from my mouth except just a shaking voice. Comforted by the thought that the Holy Spirit translates what's going on in us. And he is the one who ushers our prayers and spoken words to the throne of the grace of God. We groan. We struggle for that. But we hope for something that God will turn something new for us. Grant us something even wonderful. And in the process of that, as we look at the rest of chapter 8, we find this wonderful declaration 
who can separate us from the love of God? Who? It's not just about who, but what can separate us from the love of God? When we are in this verge of looking at the goodness of God and the problem of evil around us and our own experience of suffering, let's stand in the middle in the cross of Jesus Christ and ask the question, who and what? And the answer is nothing. nothing. We understand as human beings that we want answers to our questions. But thank God, thank God, He does not answer our questions the moment we ask of it in relation to pain, suffering, and evil. You know why? Because if God is going to answer me immediately, I would not still take His answer. Not until I realize that trusting God is the only answer I needed. God is too wise to be mistaken. God is too good to be unkind. If you don't understand, if you can't see His plan, trust His heart. You know why? Because He loves you. He loves me. And nothing can separate us from His love. Oh God, with this affirmation, we will not raise a lot of questions. Because we know that we are finite. And beyond our finitude, Lord, You have admonished us only to trust You and to obey Your word. Oh Lord, teach us also not to be careless with our lives. Guide our choices, our decisions, that they will be in line with your word and your purposes. And perhaps help our world become a better place to live. But even if there are bad things happening around us, oh God, we are not just looking from a distance. We pray that as your children, we will continue to be salt and light to wherever we are and just be there. Presence, our presence, Lord, and your presence which will envelop us as we extend grace to others because you love us so much. Amen. Thank you, God, for this final truth that we have just gotten through to this morning. The last affirmation that indeed nothing can separate us, no one can separate us from the love of God, which is in Christ Jesus our Lord, in whose name we pray. Amen. 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 It is a, indeed a good thing to always be reminded of God's love. Amen. Such a tough question to answer and yet we know it all boils down to us trusting him we always would like to make an opportunity of your of us coming on Sunday to make uh, you guys all of us to respond to the messages of the Lord and I believe one of the best thing that we can do as we answer as we respond to God is check our hearts are we saved? When we die, are we sure of heaven? So before we turn over to our MC today, I'd like us to bow down our heads. Let's close our eyes. Right now, search your heart. If you are struggling with the aspect of trust, you love Him, you always affirm yourself, I am with God, but then when you look at your life, you look at the way you respond to God, when you look at the problems in life, Somehow you are having a hard time with an aspect of trust. To the point that you don't want to give the wheel of the driver's seat to God. But you'd rather drive your life. And from time to time, 
you know, say hi to God, but you are the driver. You rather trust yourself than Him. I'd like you to respond right now in your seat. Come to Him. Talk to Him. Tell Him, Lord, I give up the driver's seat. I give back to you. I want to trust you. Second, if you don't want to trust, if you really do want to trust Him, but you're not sure of heaven when you die, I'd like to give you the opportunity right now. The only way to be sure of heaven is to tell Him, to ask Him to forgive you of your sin and ask Him to come into your life. If you would like to receive Christ as your portion, Lord and Savior, in your seat right now, I would like you to follow me in prayer. Talk to Him. Not simply follow the prayer, but follow Him. But come to Him. Talk to Him. Say this. Lord Jesus, I am a sinner. I cannot save myself. I invite you to my life. To my heart. Forgive me of my sin. Be my Savior. Be my Lord. I would like to hold on to your promise, to your word, that whosoever believes in you, you will save. Because of that, I will affirm salvation through you. In Jesus' name we pray. Let me give a prayer for you. Lord God, I don't know how people have responded. All of us have our own things in our heart. You know who asked you in their life today. You know who has surrendered their life today. I pray for them. I pray for the church. That us coming to church would not just be another event, activity once a week, but rather a constant meeting that we have in you. Thank you, Lord God. We love you, we thank you in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen.